And it looks like we're live, guys. Uh, okay. I mean, on, on YouTube, I mean that. But we'll just wait okay. for the others before we start. Um, give them 10 more minutes, 5 more minutes, I think. 5 more minutes. 5 so more minutes, start. okay. Yeah, oke. Okay. Halo, so teman-teman yang udah join, uh, thank you udah datang di join meetup hari ini. Uh, kita masih tunggu sekitar 5 menit lagi ya buat attendees yang lain buat join, jadi nggak ketinggalan materi saat presentasi. Ditunggu ya, thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone. <laughs> um, wait for the others to come. I'm not sure who, who yeah, is coming in from Manila, but yeah. Um, yeah. We're just giving a few more minutes for the others to come in and do the Zoom uh, call. As well, sorry, to webinar. That should be okay. With that, three minutes and then we can start. Three minutes. Yeah, sure. We All can right. start in three minutes. Still, Charo for uh, welcoming people. No, I'll, I'll take over for that. Uh, okay.
All right, one minute, and then we can start. Michelle, you there? Yep, here. Um, I'm gonna just segue to your, uh, like, promote the, the, the openings um, after I give the intro. Mm -hmm. Okay, All right. sure. All right. All right, I think we can start. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to a very special uh, Go Jakarta and Go Manila joint meetup. So this will be our year-end meetup. Um, thank you everyone for uh, uh, taking the time to attend. We have three speakers for you today, two from uh, Go Jakarta and uh, one representing Go Manila. So this will be a very interesting uh, meetup. I'm pretty sure there will be lots of things learned. Um, don't be shy to ask questions. Um, if you look at our chat on the Zoom and um, uh, on the, if you're looking, if you're watching through YouTube, you should see it on the chat. We have a Slido link there. That's where we will be doing all uh, our Q and A for each of the speakers today. So just please feel free to uh, ask your questions there. Um, just real quick, this uh, this this uh, joint meetup is brought to you today by Brancas. So I'm uh, to, to, to introduce myself. I'm Mark Palinar. I'm a product manager for Brancas. So we're actually hiring. Um, we have a bunch of open positions. Um, Michelle, can you share the, the sorry the screen real yep. quick? Okay, one second. Um, there we go. Can you guys see? Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to. I guess I'm going to explain it. Explain this a bit. Um, let me introduce myself. Actually, um, I'm Michelle. I'm the recruitment executive of Brancas, and we are currently hiring. Actually, and uh, as you guys can see from the poster, we're currently hiring uh, so many positions, so many open positions, uh, including backend developer, front end, QA engineer, UX, UI designer, product manager, and project manager. So, if you guys are interested, or you know someone who's currently looking, you can basically reach out to us to our career site. Uh, I'm going to put uh, the link after I present this. And you can also reach us directly to our email, uh, career email actually, uh, which is careers at Broncos. And uh, later on, I'm going to put out my uh, my own email. So you can uh, reach out to me directly for uh, recruitment and hiring. So I guess that's it. If you guys have any question, you can reach out to us to our email as well. So yeah, thank you, Marco. Back to you. All right. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Okay, so uh, to introduce our first speaker um, is Winda. So Winda yes. is uh, yeah our uh, one of the organizers of Go Manila and also part of Brancas. Uh, Winda. Um, yeah. Sure. So first of all, uh, we have two speaker here, and uh, we have Mas Hafiz from Kitabisa, and Mas Murito from Dimar. Uh, so our first uh, our first speaker who's going to present is Mas Hafiz. I'll read uh, his profile a little bit. So Hafiz Putra Ludianto will discuss Reflect Helper, a library of helper functions that works with Reflect and Go and eases reflection tasks in Go. Hafiz builds notification services for SMS, WhatsApp, and FCM at Kitabisa, where he works as a software engineer. Hafiz previously built a file warehouse service for managing temporary uploads and developed a campaign service for handling verification for medical campaign. Hafiz holds a bachelor degree from Institute Technology School in November uh, in information, uh, information system. So uh, this uh, presentation, all this presentation will be in English. So if you guys have any question, Marco already shared the link uh, on Slido. So please drop your questions there. So please must Hafiz. Thank you, Malinda. Uh, uh, okay, guys. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oh, sorry, I forget to share my screen. Okay, here. Okay, uh, did you guys see it? Uh, my presentation screen. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so as before, for just a small introduction from me. My name is Habis Putra Aldianto, and for now, I will. Uh, try to present both reflect helper, uh, reflect helper. So, wait. 
Oh, yeah. uh, good afternoon, magandang hapon po. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin, alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin, alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we are still safe and healthy and also we can meet together to discuss Reflect Helper. So, uh, in here I want to, actually I want to discuss about Reflect Helper. So, it's not uh, like I want to only present about Reflect Helper, but I want to share with you about the helper and I want you guys maybe uh, to ask some questions to me or proactive with me. So it's two way communications, not uh, one way communication. Uh, so uh, basically, referral helper is just a library. Okay, it's on. And uh, it's, uh, you can see this library like uh, this is a normal and everyday library that you can find anywhere in GitHub. Uh, also, you can use this library for uh, any purpose. So it's just a collection of helper function. That's uh, the purpose of this library is to easing the manipulation of reflect. So sometimes if you guys have ever handled the reflect in Golang and you want to manipulate the uh, reflect value or reflect object, uh, you can use this library. Uh, the features that this library supports, uh, there are some features, but it's not all features I listed here. Uh, there is uh, there are value extraction, assignment, uh, type manipulation, can manipulation, empty checker, and etc. Uh, actually, guys, I didn't uh, want to share or discuss more detail about Reflect because uh, because there's uh, some limited time for me to discuss about Reflect Helper. So if you want to search for Reflect, what is Reflect and what the details of the Reflect or uh, what's Reflect about, you can find in any sources or Googling it, or maybe you can try to uh, read uh, from the official documentation in the link here. I've already given the link in my presentation. <clears throat> Okay, so the first case I want to show to you guys that uh, here, uh, if you want to get the element of a variable of reflect value. So sometimes if you want, uh, if you have a variable of pointer and you want to get the element of that pointer, uh, you guys will do like this. So you initialize the test variable with uh, the type is an integer pointer and you assign some value in a variable and you reference the that the variable x here and you want to extract the what is it the uh, test value here using reflect yeah you could do this but when you use reflect helper you only need to use a function named get chat lamp so uh, it this function uh, helps you to automatically extract the value contained in the uh, pointer variable so you don't need to what is it? You don't need to call dot elm and dot elm. You just need to call a function, and it automatically automatically extract the value for you. Uh, here's some code to demonstrate. Oh, okay. I guess you did. You see my second screen? Uh, sorry, sorry. My code Visual Studio code. I'm just changing the. Uh, maybe the panelists. Hello. Yeah, we can see. It. Okay, okay. I'm sorry because uh, maybe the. Uh, the Zoom doesn't support virtual desktop. So here I have uh, two code that represent the case that I have presented to you in the presentation. When we try to run this code, it actually runs fine. Okay, let's say that this is case one. Uh, here, you can see that. You can see that uh, the result is the same. But for the first one, you call dot lm and dot lm. So uh, yeah, this is good if you know that uh, the pointer uh, is a one level pointer. But if you have two level pointer uh, like this, I think it's gonna panic. Let's say this is x. Um, let's test. See. Uh, this is the case why uh, uh, what this is very dangerous because uh, if we know the type of the pointer uh, on the 
on the what is it compile time i think it's okay so that you don't have to what is it uh, you don't have to call dot lm dot lm like uh, i mean you you can call dot lm dot lm but if we don't know the type at the runtime uh, this could be dangerous because it could uh, make the code go panic and for the second case i want to talk to you about uh, this is about the get the element type of variable of reflect value. So for the first case, it is about the reflect manipulation. The second case I talked about is about the type manipulation. Sometimes we want to get the type of the slice. Uh, see here. So on the first case, uh, you can call what is it reflect value of here test slice. This is a slice. Uh, it's like array in Golang, but it's like a uh, what is it? Advanced array that can expand uh, itself, and then you call. Oh, sorry. And you call. You can call the type and dot lm dot lm dot lm. Uh, why I call lm three times here? Because uh, the variable pass, passed in here is a reference for to reference. So it's like a multi-level reference. So that uh, you see, it's like uh, I want actually I want to get the type of uh, integer here, but uh, somehow I passing the reference for to the reference of to the reference of the slice. So I need to call uh, lm multiple times. Uh, this is really dangerous. Yeah, if if we know that it is um, if we if we know that uh, it is a uh, what is it second level pointer, I think it's okay. But if it is there, if there's more second level pointer, I think uh, it it will go panic like, like the case before. So when using reflect helper, you don't have to what is it uh, to concern yourself about uh, calling dot lm dot lm dot lm multiple times, but you just pass this uh, pass the reflect value reflect object to the get child lm type, and uh, you uh, you get the type that you want. Let's uh, let me demonstrate. Okay, let's go to case two. Okay, then we run the case two here. Uh, here, uh, it is the same. So the, oh sorry sorry, it is case five. Oh, here nah. So when we want to get actually in this code, we want to make a new array that is uh, with the type uh, from the test slice. So we call we to get the type of the test slice here to get the element type of the test slice here. We need to call this dot lm dot lm multiple times, uh, and then. After that, we set the first uh, element of that array to three, and uh, we print the array. The, this is actually the same code, but the difference is in the second code, I am using reflect helper. So with the root reflect helper, I don't need to care about that lm that lm that lm. I just uh, getting the type of the slice of the slice that I have made before, and um, and then after that, I. Uh, I just make the array with the type that have been returned by this function. So there's a significant difference that uh, before I have to manually know the type at the compile time uh, at before the program gets compiled. And in here, I just passing it at this at this school. So it doesn't need to know uh, what is it. Uh, doesn't need to know how many multi-level reference to that uh, reflect object to the slice object. Okay, so for the next case, uh, let's go. Let's go to the next case. So for the case two, it is about type manipulation, and then for the case three, it is about um, yeah, it's the, it's almost the same with the uh, case one. It's about the reflect object manipulation, but in here uh, we get the kind of the we get, uh, we want to get the kind of the reflect object. So it's it's like a kind manipulation. So in here, uh, in the first code, we want to get the can of the integer. Uh, we want to get the can of the test variable here. Uh, that is the pointer to pointer to pointer uh, integer. But you can see that in this code, I have to call dot l multiple times and get the can uh, the child can for uh, the variable test. Uh, so it's like a redundance and sometimes it's not safe if you don't know the exact. Uh, level of pointer or reference to the variable. So I, in here, the second case, uh, sorry, in the second code, I just used, uh, uh, what is it, the function of get child lm pointer can. So let's demonstrate this code. So in the case three, 
uh, I have this is the first code, and then this is the second code. So let's uh, let's just run it. Yeah, this is the same. Actually, the code is the same, but the difference is I have to call dot lm dot lm dot lm here multiple times. But in here, I only call one function to just return the chat uh, chat lm kind of the variable test. So uh, it's more safer uh, rather than call that element here because when I decrease here by one, uh, it could go go panic. You see, just go panic like that. So, but how about like this? Uh, okay, let's say that I want to test for this function. Okay. Okay, it's same. Uh, this this is more safer than here because in here I don't care about to calling the dot lm multiple times, but in here I just uh, I care very, I care very what is it very uh, I care very much uh, how much uh, how many times I call dot lm in here. So uh, this is uh, the, what is it the benefit of using reflect helper. So do, you don't need to uh, care about how many times you call dot lm in here. Okay, uh, and then the fourth. The fourth case, it's it is about the extraction of uh, reflect value. So, uh, reflect value contains some variable or maybe object or something, and then we we want to extract the value of that reflect value. Uh, let's say the case here. For example, I want I have a string a string value of one. Uh, here is test file. Test file is variable that is a reflect value of string one, and then I want to get the pool of that uh, test file object uh, in here. Uh, actually, when in the normal case, if you want to get the pool value of the string value, you need uh, you can use uh, str conf package from the Golang and you use the parsable function that uh, what sorry uh, that the string here that you call dot string to get the string value of the reflect object. Uh, yeah, I think it. This is okay, but sometimes the test file here, test file variable here, uh, sometimes it is not the, what is it? It is not string. Sometimes it's integer or maybe it's unsigned integer or it could be object struct or anything else. So when using reflect helper, I don't care about the reflect object in here. It is, if it is string or maybe if it is uh, integer, unsigned integer, uh, it automatically uh, detect the reflect object, the kind of reflect object, and uh, extract it based on its kind. So uh, let's see about the case here. Okay, here in the case four, I have the code. Yeah, it's actually the same code, but uh, we want to run. I want to demonstrate the code so that you can guess can see for yourself. Okay. Okay, here. So this is actually the same code. But the difference is that I set the string here to one. In the parsable function, it actually decodes to true. Uh, in here, I set the string to false, false, literal false. So it's not like integer or something. Uh, and then I just pass to the extract will function here from the reflect helper. So in here, uh, the two of them is automatically this uh, extract the what is it the value of the pool. But uh, from here, I have to convert this uh, what is it this test file to what uh, you can say that to string. So it's not effective because sometimes if we want to what is it? Yeah, actually you we can't pass here like this. But maybe I don't know how can it ah see it's become a uh, panic because it's in integer value invalid syntax. So it is like when I see pass the integer here, it gets error because of uh, because this is not actually string, but it is integer. So uh, the the string value of the integer object in here in the reflect value is invalid. But for what about if this? I uh, wait. Let's set this. Yeah, no. Okay. Let's set this to uh, normal. Let's roll back it again. And I oh sorry, I mistyped something. Yeah, what about like this? Yeah, it's actually runs fine because in here uh, in the extractable function, it actually automatically detects the kind of the reflect object and parse the uh, parsing the bool uh, based on its kind. So it's uh, we don't need to uh, know the type at the compile time. We just need only to pass it to the function and let the function help you to decode that uh, value. Uh, it's a, it's almost the same like this. It's okay. Yeah. 
this is with uh, the same result as before but in here i set it without in the, uh, with integer value not the string value okay let's go to the next case okay in here uh this is the same feature that i talked about in the second slide uh, sorry third slide uh this is of the assignment of two variables uh with different type so sometimes if you want to uh, okay let this is this example uh, example so if you want like let's see this i have unsigned integer file in here that is un, uh, the type is unsigned integer 64 with the value is 65 and here i have the integer file with the value of the uh, pointer integer and here we see that uh, I initialize a variable hello that is zero and I assign integer file here to n hello. It is like initializing the integer file so it the, it doesn't contain nil value. And then uh, I want to assign the, what is it? Unsigned, uh, unsigned integer file to the integer file here. So uh, here I uh, call value of reference integer file and I call dot lm again and call dot lm again uh, to get the integer type here and then I call reflect value in here and I said set uh, set integer here uh, sign a ref dot set integer integer 64 and I call for ref dot unsigned integer like here and then uh, this is the printing okay the second code is using reflect helper but with different approach, I just calling the send reflect here. I, I I call get in chat lm. Actually, this is the function to uh, to initialize the uh, uninitialized variable. So uh, integer file here is like a pointer integer. Uh, the type is in uh, pointer integer, but it is still uninitialized. So we need to initialize it first to use the variable. So I call here get in chat lm with the reflect value of uh, a pointer integer file if we don't passing the pointer we cannot set the integer integer file variable here so i passing the address to the integer file and then i passing the value reflect value of unsigned integer file here and uh, actually it's just the same but uh, what i mean is uh, the first, the second code yeah works with uh, works similarly with the second code but in here uh, it is more simple and more safely than this first code so i will demonstrate the code for the case five here is this is the first code i had talked about and this is the second code uh let's say okay let's run the case five in here see it's the same uh they print the same value but the difference is that i uh, have to know the type uh actually at uh, compile time or before the program gets uh, running and then I have to call that lm dot lm again here it's like uh, similar to the case before and this is and here I have to call that set integer because I have to know again that the assigner type is integer so this is really yeah frustrating because sometimes it the integer file here can change to integer maybe to unsigned integer or maybe to uh, something else like that so it's not uh, efficient and effective uh, but in here i don't care about the type i just only need to initialize the sign uh, initialize the signer uh, reflect value and then uh, i just pass the reflect value of the fail uh, what is it the yeah the file yeah, the value the unsigned integer file here and it automatically assign uh, and detect it based on its kind so I don't have to do many work here to know about the type of year, uh, the type of unsigned integer file and integer file. I just need to only know the, what uh, what is it? Uh, I just need to initialize the assigner and let it be done, just like that. Okay, uh, actually this word disclaimer, this is only the example cases. So uh, maybe in the real world cases or in the practical appliance of this, it is not so simple as this, but uh, I just only want to show you that uh, there's sometimes there's cases like this that maybe you can handle it with reflect helper. It's like it. Uh, okay, we we can actually explore other cases. I don't list the other cases here. It is an empty slide that shows you that there are so many other cases that is uncovered uh, uncovered in here. Uh, so like maybe like parser or maybe sometimes like. Uh, assignment for struct. I don't include the assignment for struct because I think it. I, um, 
there is a signal for struct, but I don't show the example because it is uh, complicated and uh, the sometimes it is used in the database parser or maybe in the what is it configuration parser or something like that. Okay, uh, that's it, guys. Thank you, Salamat Po. Any questions? So there is one question um, right now from the Q&A uh, in yes. the Zoom. Yeah, so in normal case, why is LM caller uh, four times while pointer is triple? Wait, wait, wait. Let me open chat first. Sorry, sorry, wait, yeah. wait a minute. Ah, I see. How can I see the chat in here? Okay, so it's okay. Uh, so is the, the question is um, in normal case yeah. why is LM uh, caller I guess called fault four times and why is pointer triple? Um, you can oh, just okay. answer. I'll, I'll, yeah. uh, okay. Thank you for the questions. Wait, it. Which case? Which case is that uh, LM get press uh, called four times? I think in yes. just in normal case, yeah. Uh, wait a let me let me switch the presentation here or maybe in here where, where is it okay. hello uh pardon could you give me the which case uh that uh it, it, doesn't say, it just says here in normal case yeah case three you're right case okay three. three case three okay so why do i call i need to call four times lm in here uh you see that there is uh this is a triple level pointer of integer so triple level is like pointer the first level is pointer and the second pointer uh and the second level is pointer again and the third level is pointer but when i passing the uh what is it to the reflect value of function here uh, i passing a um, reference to the test variable so it becomes the fourth level pointer so when you pass it when you okay let's 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 demonstrate in here uh it's case three right okay so when i call uh, when i what is it uh passing the ref address uh reference of the test variable here i actually make it like seems like this it's almost the same yeah but uh why i'm i'm passing uh what is it why i'm passing the n here because in this case, when I'm passing the test variable, what is it? Test reflect value. Uh, the the what is it? The value of the test variable here is actually nil. Okay, let's me so use. Okay. It's three. See, still it is still integer, but. Uh, the value contained it in in there is nil. So sometimes when I play with reflect, I don't want to get a nil value in there. I only just want to get the uh, what is it the address value because if it is nil, it cannot it couldn't set any value in there. So when I uh, okay, let's play it with uh, a little with a little. So in here, if you want to get only the type of the variable, it's normal. But if you play it like this. Test. Mm, okay, the effect value of test, and you want to kind of some. Let's say let's set something in here. I just uh, okay. This is a bad practice, so don't uh, don't do it if uh, in the production code. So you need still need to check some. Sometimes you need still need to check your code. It, it is it panic or not? Okay, let's just some, set something here. Uh, integer one maybe. Oh wait, it is. It should be reflected too. Okay, so this is gonna be panic. Trust me. Here I will try. So here, uh, when you are using the what is it? When you just passing the value of test here without the uh, what is it? Without the address, you cannot set it because it is still uh, invalid value. It is still nil. Uh, as printed before, and it is uh, uninitial, initial, initialisable. So you need to initialize it first. Uh, the simple 
uh, what is it? The simple way to do that is just using the address. So when you are using the address, I think this is gonna be friend. Okay, let's uh, okay, let's say that I want to uh, here. Make it, this is just a simple. What is it? This is just a simple. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Masabi, uh, here's yes, a here's just a follow up question. Um, so, um, but, uh, so he's asking why do we pass the reference to reflect value, and yeah, then uh, why will it why will uh, nil be there if you're passing reference since it's already nesting uh, 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 three pointers. It's already nesting of three pointers basically. Uh, sorry, sorry, pardon, pardon. Okay, so the first question is why why do we pass reference to reflect value? Let's try to answer that first. Oh yeah, this uh, already answered because uh, if you want to set uh, some variable, uh, some value to the reflect object, we need to pass the address to the, uh, we need to reference the uh, variable. So we cannot only passing the, what is it? Uh, so it must be ad addressable in the, for the reflect. But, so you cannot pass the nil pointer or you cannot passing the invalid value. But uh, for this, sorry, pardon for the second question, what is it? What is it? So uh, for the second question, why will nil be there if you are passing reference, since it's already it's already nesting of three pointers? Ah oh, yes, because it is. Thank you, thank you for the questions. Yes, why it is nil still nil be there? Yes, because the uh, normally when you uh, initialize variable like this, when you declare variable test with the uh, pointer integer here, it actually contains nil in here. Okay, this is just a simple word. And when you get nil here, you cannot do anything. I mean, with the when it is get reflected, uh, you cannot set the ob reflect object here. Uh, you cannot set anything here. It it's it is uh, nil invalid. Okay, let me show you. Just uh, showing is uh, faster than uh, talking. Okay, then found test. Oh, uh, oh no, no, no. Surface s dot is dress. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Yeah. Okay, here. Ah, see. So the when it is uh, declared this way, like this far test on pointer integer here, uh, you see that when it is passed to the reflect value of here, we, you could uh, you create a new reflect object with the variable test here. Uh, see that it it the the value contained in that variable is nil. And it is still an initialized variable, or you can say that it is still an initialized pointer. When it is an initialized, you cannot address anything in the, uh, what is it? You cannot set anything in the uh, variable. So you cannot set uh, the reflect object you cannot use dot set a method in the reflect object, and you cannot. Uh, yeah, you just get an, uh, a nil m or this is a reflect value like that uh, reflect object. So it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, in here that why I sometimes uh, using dot uh, and address pointer in here because sometimes I get the habit of I want to set the variable of uh, I want to set the reflect object in there. So this this function is actually uh, checking that uh, is the reflect object could be what is it could be set or not. You could uh, could could you set the var over what is it the variable or the reflect object in there? Uh, could you use the variable in there? Could you use to use the reflect object in there? Uh, here you can if you don't initialize the variable here, you cannot set anything in here. That's the principle. Okay. One more so, question from Roh from the same guy for since Rohan. Um, so I think this is one question, but he typed us too. So, um, so why why do we need to set reflect object? Is it because we want to get the type and not the content of the variable? Okay. I have I have seen it. Oh. Okay. Okay. Here. Uh. Let uh, Let me say it. Uh. The case is about like this. Uh. So. Sometimes, uh, if you want to set the value of the reflect object, yeah, you could. Uh, you need to address the variable. But uh, because of my habit, when using reflect, I want to set a reflect uh, object. Uh, I actually sometimes fiddling with the parser or with the assigner of the database value like that. So uh, when I use that, uh, sometimes I have to address the variable 
for if it is pointer. So uh, if you only want to get a can like here, I think you, it's okay if you don't need to. What is it? Uh, calling the what? Uh, calling the uh, referencing the variable. It is okay if you don't want to reference the variable. You don't need to passing the reference to the variable. But when you want to reference the variable and you want to get the kind of that variable and you want to set it also uh, you want to set the value of the reflect object or the variable itself then you need to reference the variable so uh, because of my habit when you when you see that uh, okay i want i have this variable for test integer here but i want to uh, get the kind of the variable here and also i want to set the file test here the reflect object here so uh, it is more safer uh, to reference the test variable here rather than uh, you just passing the test variable here, but it is still uninitialized. So the principle is like that. Uh, this is the case if the variable hasn't been initialized, but uh, if the variable has been initialized, I think it is safer. I also haven't tested it yet. Okay, let's say that. Uh, let's say that. Um, five tests and become reference t here and you want to set it like this okay and then file test dot l let's see let's see i haven't test this so maybe it could be wrong could go wrong yeah oh i think it's fine see uh if you have initialized i think it's okay but if you haven't initialized it initialize the variable here like this it, it this, this goes panic See, the the flag here uh, showing that uh, the reflect object must be signable, but we have an initialized uh, pointer in here, so it, it could not be set. It is like that. Okay, so let's see. Where's the chat? I get the chat here. Okay, okay. Uh, is there any questions, or maybe is this the limit of the questions? Or is this uh, already answer your question? Oh, wait. You are mute, yeah. Marco. Sorry. Yeah, I think Rowan says uh, thank you. He says thank you for answering the question. I think it answered his, his, uh, okay, his okay. question. Okay, okay. Are there any other questions from the um, attendees? Okay, I think that's it. Okay. Thank okay, you. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. thank you guys. Yeah, uh, anything else you want to say to um all right. Okay. Uh thank you. you uh, for the, they can oh, sorry, sorry, what? Uh, they can find reflect help help you in this repository. Oh yeah, yes, this is the link if you want. I haven't public uh what is it? Publish the uh the code for the presentation but later you can find it on my repository list for the code here that i have uh, used for uh sharing this reflect helper you can uh, you could later find it but this is the link to the published uh, repository of reflect helper so that's it uh thank you marco and thank you for the others for asking uh thank you for being proactive uh wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh so thank you so much mas hafiz uh apa untuk presentasinya so uh we are going to uh we're going to move to our second speaker this is mas mudito from dimar hello mas hello hi yeah so i'll read a little bit of uh, his profile so um Mudito Adi Pranowo, he will share about the secret of robust data protection using Go and HSM, in which he will detail using encryption process, uh, processes to protect data with a standard crypto package in Go, and will outline how to prevent security keys from being stolen from running applications and doing so for production application. Mudito will also discuss building stronger and more robust data protection systems. Murito has over 12 years experience in practical cryptography for business and data security solutions and currently works as a product and marketing manager at PT Dimar Jaya Indonesia. Murito finished his study at Unikatma Jaya in electrical engineering. So he will present it in English. 
So uh, after presentation, like uh, like our previous speaker, there will be question and answer. So be prepared for your question, and we will answer it together live. Okay. So please, Mas Mudito, you can start okay. now. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So uh, can you also see my screen? Yeah, you're good yes. to go. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, thanks uh, for Go Jakarta and Go Manila uh, for this opportunity and having me here. So today I will uh, share about uh, secret of robust data protections uh, using Go and HSMs. So this is about the data encryptions or data protections. Uh, first, uh, before I start my presentations, I want to introduce myself. Uh, so uh, this, my name is uh, Mudito Adi Pranowo, so you can call me Mudito. And I have a 12, uh, more than 12 years experience in practical cryptography for business and data security solutions and implementation for banking, financial institutions, e-commerce, government, and et cetera. So uh, actually I'm not the, uh, a programmer. I do coding just for a hobby. Yeah, um, I can uh, do a coding for Java, Python, Golang, and um, many programming languages. Um, but I do programming just especially for integrations with the security products. And uh, I love technology, music, and art. And also I'm a uh, bachelor degree from uh, Unica Atmajaya in electrical engineering. And now I am uh, work in PT Dimarjaya Indonesia as a product manager and marketing. So if you want to uh, contact me, you can drop some emails in uh, this uh, address, mudito at bimarjaya.co.id. So I want to uh, uh, introduce about my companies. Um, I work in uh, PT Dimarjaya Indonesia. So Dimar uh, already founded in uh, 88. 1988, and our focus in the data security solutions. And we providing data security solutions, uh, especially for hardware security module, to more than 80 banks and financial institutions in Indonesia. So I, I think uh, maybe uh, more than 90% banks in Indonesia uh, use our solution for data security. And so if you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can go to our websites or our social media. So uh, this is uh, our customers. Yeah, um, most of them is uh, from bank, and uh, there's some financial and fintech, and uh, from governments as well. And also we have a uh, YouTube channels. Uh, so if you want to know about knowledge about data security, you can uh, see or watch into our YouTube channel. So now I'm going uh, to the uh, uh, my topic. So let me if it less pointer. Yeah, um, we will talk about the encryptions. Um, encryption itself is a last line of defense. So, so if we talk about security, many kind of uh, tools or uh, technique to secure uh, our critical assets like a data. So you can use uh, like a perimeter security. Maybe uh, all of you ever heard about firewall, IDS, IPS, uh, anti-malware, antivirus, and so on, or DLP. Um, but uh, when we talk about uh, data security or encryptions, uh, we do uh, like a data-centric approach. So we uh, are trying to protect uh, directly to the data. Okay. So encryption is a part of cryptography. Cryptography is uh, comes from a Greek uh, word. Uh, it's from cryptos and graph. Cryptos it means hidden or secret, and graph it means uh, writing. So uh, cryptography it means like uh, writing in hidden or secret way. So in a cryptographic, uh, you also will heard about the terminology like algorithm. Algorithm is like a formula how you calculate. Uh, from a data and we will transform to the uh, secret data. So uh, there is a, like a triple dash, AES, RSA, ECC, uh, MD5, SHA, or Bcrypt and etc. Maybe uh, from uh, 
for for a Go programmer, uh, they are uh, uh, familiar with the Bcrypt yeah, or uh, AES or RSA. So this is a. Uh, I will give you some example uh, about the encryptions. For example, if we have a uh, data like in here, example plain the example plain text. So I want to uh, encrypt this text. I I need a key. Yeah, the key is something like this. So this is not a physical key. This is a digital key. Yeah. So the form is something like this. And we, if we encrypt this text with this key, uh, maybe with the AES algorithm, for example, and then the result or the cipher text uh, is uh, something like this. Yeah. This is the encrypted data. So this is the encryptions. Uh, encryption is everywhere. So uh, every every day, uh, maybe you, you you do many things activation activity, and then uh, I think uh, our activity today or our lifestyle uh, also involves the encryption process. Um, for example, uh, every day you do a browsing. Okay, uh, when you browsing, it means uh, you use a uh, features uh, called HTTPS. And HTTPS itself is uh, encryption uh, techniques also. And for example, if you want to withdraw or transfer money from ATM, so uh, if in the background, actually the pin distributions and how we uh, protect the pin in the bank, it's also using encryptions. Or if you go to the minimart, to buy something and then you pay with the EDC. Yeah, you swipe your card into the machine uh, on the on the uh, EDC. Also, you use encryptions to protect the data for for your PIN or your uh, data transactions. Or if you do like a mobile banking, yeah, you you put your password, you put your PIN, and then uh, you transfer money. Uh, using mobile banking. Also, uh, for the distributions of transactions to protect your passwords, also use uh, encryptions. Yeah, for example, another uh, for internet banking, uh, for login authentication into apps, for uh, online shopping, or storing your password account, electronic money. Yeah, in Indonesia, there is a busway or Transjakarta, uh, or toll road, parking, and train using uh, electronic money. Uh, also, to um, issue the card, it's using encryption uh, technology or uh, electricity token number, yeah. Uh, EID card, yeah, uh, IKTP uh, Indonesia, in Indonesia, or uh, access card, uh, blockchain, uh, PDF file protections, VPN, and uh, many things. So I would like to say that encryption is everywhere. And thanks to Go, uh, because Go already provide a package crypto, this is uh, for cryptographic or encryption process in Go. Uh, you can use it if you want, yeah. And I will go to, uh, there is some example how to use encryptions in Go. Yeah, this is official from Go. You can go to uh, golang.org slash source slash crypto slash cipher slash example underscore test dot Go, yeah. Uh, you see here, there is some example how to encrypt the plain text, example plain text with the key. Uh, the key value is the six three six eight six one, and so on. Um, what we will see, there is some uh, comment in here. Uh, go say that uh, you should load your secret key from a safe place. Okay, from a safe place. Um, so. The question is, where's the safe place to save the key? So we should know that encryption actually is easy. Why? Because uh, if you want to learn about encryptions, about the algorithm, how to do encryptions, you can Google it in the internet. And if the encryption is a standard industry, it means uh, it public, the, the information is everywhere. You can learn it. There's no secret. Uh, uh, to, to learn about encryptions. But the thing is about the key management. The key management is hard. It's not easy to uh, 
to manage the key. Key management it means like uh, how you generate the key, how you store the key the key securely, and how you distribute the key, and how you rotate the key, and how you destroy the key. So uh, in uh, our uh, real life, for example, if you put your key, your 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 house key, under the mat, so you gonna have a problems because if somebody got your key and he or she can enter into your house, right? So it's a similar thing in the digital world. So you should protect your key when you do uh, encryptions. If not, hacker can open your encrypted data. So hackers will not break your encryptions because uh, doing a uh, break the encryption itself is uh, too many efforts to do that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like a years uh, to get to get break the encryptions, but uh, the hackers will search your keys. Now, I give you some options to save place uh, about uh, how to save the keys. Maybe one of you think that okay, I can save the key uh, in the code, or it means hard coded like in the GoLang example. Yeah, or maybe I will put the key in a file and then I protect or password the file or I put it in the configuration file. I'm sure many of you doing this, yeah. Or uh, maybe I put on the memory, but the problem in the memory is uh, when, we, when our server is down, the key will destroy. So you cannot keep it. Uh, or maybe another technique is uh, I will build a dedicated server. I will build the computer and I will store the key on that server. Or the last uh, option is using a hardware security module. Okay, I, I assume that we will use a key protected in file. We will protect the key in file and then uh, uh, maybe we can uh, protect with password or no, okay? Okay, let's, we go back to the example from uh, Go, yeah? You can see on here, this is the same example that I showed you before. Um, okay, uh, we will focus on here, yeah, again. Uh, Go mentioned that we should load your secret key, yeah, this key, from a safe place. Okay, this is important things. Then, I use choose the best or a good algorithm for my encryptions. Um, go give the example using AES, yeah. So uh, the question is, uh, how safe is the AES encryptions? You can uh, see or go to the uh, nist.gov uh, website. This is a National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, that uh, define about the standard of cryptographic algorithms. And if you go here and then you download the files and you will get some information about this. Um, yeah, uh, this document will uh, inform you that uh, some algorithms is not recommended. For example, this like a triple dash. Uh, if you ever heard about triple dash uh, encryptions, uh, actually this is a algorithm uh, that not recommended to use it right now because it's already deprecated. And this this load after 2023. Yeah, you can see on here. And how about the AES? Yeah, the AES is acceptable. So yeah, we can use it. Okay. Now we go to the uh, our code. Yeah, this is uh just I just uh, copy and paste in the, uh, the example from uh, Google website. Uh, sorry, the Go GoLang website. I paste on here. Yeah, this is the same key you see on here. I want to encrypt the example plain text, but because uh, Go said that we should load the key from a safe place, so I uh, disable this line code, yeah. And then I uh, put the key in a file. I call it a secret key. So I, I create a, a file and then I put the key inside the secret key. So that's why I put 
this code to load the file, the secret key file, and then I read the content, and then I pass to the key variable. So I hope I already load my secret key from a safe place. Okay. Then I also doing this. Hmm. I think uh, if I use the key, I need to destroy the key. So that's why I will delay with uh, replace the uh, key value on the variable key using nil. Okay. So in a programmer point of view, uh, you should think that oh with with uh, put the nil value in here, I will replace the key. So now the key is not, uh, there is no anymore. So no one can get the key, okay? The problem is, uh, okay, this is uh, only a joke, yeah. There is a Golang icon say that, okay, I'm sure it's safe, yeah. But if, uh, do you ever heard about the stealing encryption key from memory? Okay, uh, may, maybe um, most of you think that ah, this is only a myth. It's very hard to, to, to find a key from a memory. Okay. Uh, if you see on the screen, there is a pictures, and these illustrations uh, illustrate about the data inside memory. Yeah. And you can find many patterns in here, the left side, and with different uh, with the pattern in the uh, middle side and in the right side. So uh, the question is, where is the key? Key actually uh, in a random value or uh, in a noisy value. So uh, if you see on the on the screen, the key informations in, in the middle of the figure is looks more noisy than the rest of data. So if you want to know more about this uh, uh, techniques, you can read the paper from uh, Adi Shamir and Nico van Sombren. Adi Shamir is a cryptographer. Uh, he one of uh, creator of RSA uh, algorithm. And Nico van Sombren is uh, also the cryptographer, I think. And uh, he's a pioneer uh, for a hardware security uh, products. Uh, and in, in the paper, tile, title is uh, Playing Hide and Seek with Stored Keys. Yeah, this is uh, in September 22 in 1988. So it's a long time ago, but still relevant with uh, our today uh, technology. So before I continue, I want to give a disclaimer because uh, uh, this information is uh, quite dangerous, yeah? So this information is only for educational purpose only. And please do not use this information to do a bad things, yeah? Don't do this to damaging some uh, systems. Uh, because uh, you should know that uh, if you're doing a hack to the computers or system that uh, you not own, uh, it means it's illegal, yeah? And we, uh, me and my company, Dimar, will not be responsible if any direct or indirect damage cause uh, do these information of this tutorial. Okay. Okay. If you ever uh, know about uh, automatic key finding, you can go to this website. Yeah. This is a uh, education's uh, website, I think. Yeah. It's from citp.princeton.edu. Okay. Um, you can download for free in here. There is a AES key finder and RSA key finder. Yeah. And you should uh, using uh, one more tools called uh, G4. Yeah. Or uh, you can install it using a GDB. Yeah. Yeah. Based on uh, those tools, we can steal a key. Okay. Let me show you. Now in here, we just uh, try to run our code. Yeah, previously we already created the, the, the code and then now we run it, okay? And then I will uh, try to search the process using uh, this comment, ps space uh, dash a, 
and then I will get the uh, encryption AAS process with PID 2649. This is uh, in this example, but maybe we'll different with the other system. And I just use uh, this simple command, sudo gcore and the PID process, the 2649, and I press enter, I put my password, and then uh, this process already dump the memory. Dump the memory uh, specific to this process. Okay, and then save into the uh, files called core.2649. Okay. Um, in Windows, if you do it in Windows, it's more easily because uh, to dumping the memory, uh, you only do uh, using a task manager and then you find uh, the specific process and you just uh, right click and then create dump file. That's it. You got the dump file. Then, uh, not, now I got the dump file called the core.2649 and then I just run the AS key find to the dump file. And I press enter, then I get the key. Yeah, you see on this. So uh, you can compare the value, yeah, the key I get from the AAS key find and then uh, with the key from uh, my secret key file is totally the same. So I'll give uh, you some quick demo to do this. Yeah, let me show you. Uh, are there any questions? Oh, wait, okay. So you can you see my screen? Oh, okay, sorry, I thought. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, in this folder, I got this uh, my code. Yeah, you can go. You can download this uh, from our GitHub in the my GitHub. Yeah. Um, I go to the Dolan AS, and I have uh, this Go code in here. Yes. I copy paste this code from the uh, Dolan example. I just uh, put some codes or modified a little bit in here. Yeah. To load the keys from uh, the file, yeah. The secret key in here. Yeah. Then I try to destroy the key. So what should I do is, uh, Okay, so sorry, so my time is up or what? Yeah, so I just uh, run the, the code, yeah. So this is the ciphertext. Yeah. If you think that your data is already secure, yeah, maybe you're wrong, okay. Then, um, Okay, in here I I, I will uh, try to find the where is the process of uh, encryptions AES. Okay, this, the PID is a two five five two. Yeah, so I just uh, doing a gcore command and I put the PID number two five five two. Okay. Yep. Okay, now I have a core.2552. This is a uh, dump file. I dumped the memory, yeah. So I just uh, use uh, the AES key tools, AES key find tools. Sorry. Find, and then uh, the core. Yep, yes. Okay, just for a second, we get the key. If you see, yeah, the key is totally the same. So meaning that the uh, 
your key already gets stolen yeah, by someone. So I will go back to my screen. Uh, hold on. Yeah, so uh, what is the meaning of this? Uh, if you have, if you, if you've got the key, it means uh, you can uh, you can decrypt the cipher text and then you get the plain text, get the data. Um, this not only for AES algorithm, but also works for RSA and this works for another programming language like C or Java. And it's not only in Linux, but you can do this on Windows as well. So I just uh, give uh, some little bit demonstrations how to decrypt uh, the ciphertext in here. I got ciphertext, yeah. Just the value is, uh, you, you, you can uh, get it from ciphertext. Okay. And then I have the key because I already steal the key from the memory. And I put another uh, parameters called initial factors, yeah. And then I just decrypt. Now I got the, so you just uh, should be careful to uh, doing encryptions in Go. And the best option to protect your key is uh, in a hardware security module. So what is the HSM or hardware security module? Actually, HSM is like a server. Um, and the server has the, like a temper detections or response mechanisms and it certifies uh, with uh, called FIPS. Yeah. And this is a standard uh, industry. So uh, if there is someone want to steal the key or uh, trying to open the box, uh, the key will destroy automatically. And the key uh, will generate it inside and no one knows about the value of keys and you if you want to uh, back up the key, it will back up into the smart, uh, smart cards, uh, some smart cards. And if you want to restore back the key or roll back the key, you should uh, provide all the smart cards. So it's like a nuclear um, technology, yeah. So uh, why HSM? So uh, you can imagine if uh, there is a disgruntled employee in your companies and for example, he or she don't like with your companies and then he's trying to steal some data and then your data is lost so you should protect your uh, key yeah or you, you you should protect the systems and there is a uh, terms that uh, saying that encrypted data is only as secure as its decryption key it means like i like i uh, demo before i already get the key so i can decrypt the data i i can encrypt I can decrypt the encrypted data. And then uh, you should understand about the, a computer is only as secure as the administrator is trustworthy. So uh, if you're trying to store the key in a dedicated server, so you rely on the administrator. If the administrator is trusted and maybe you're in a secure uh, situations, but if administration bad, the bad people and then you will get the uh, problems. Yeah. And another thing, uh, this is important about the human error and cryptographic coding skills. So for example, uh, you are uh, the owner of the companies and then you want uh, to protect your all data and you hire a fresh graduate developer and then you force them to build a code to doing a cryptography to protect your data. I think it's not make sense because uh, not easier for a fresh graduate developer to build a good uh, cryptography uh, applications. And in the other side, if you as a developer and then you hire, hire uh, from uh, companies and then uh, the companies want to pay you high, yeah, but uh, companies say to you that you should responsible if any data uh, will breach or stolen by someone. So maybe you don't want to uh, have this job. Yeah. Or about the uh, achieve compliance. So this is uh, important for business. Actually uh, in business, 
want to uh, run their business uh, and then uh, they, they, they should uh, achieve some compliance uh, before uh, they can go to business. Uh, so uh, HSMs, it makes it easy to achieve the, the compliance. So uh, this is a look like the HSM, yeah. So if you want to know how to integrate the HSM with Go applications, you can go to our GitHub in github.com slash Or if uh, you're using another type of HSM called uh, general purpose HSM, you can go to the github.com slash tells ignite slash crypto 11. So I will give you a quick uh, step how to integrate the Go applications with uh, HSM. So the step one is uh, about generate or uh, import the keys. So it's very recommended to generate the key using HSM, using the hardware, rather than we import the clear key. You see on this, uh, I got this value from the example from Golang. Yeah, uh, this is a clear key. You can import this clear key to the HSMs and the uh, value, the, the result is like this, yeah. So this is, is not a uh, key anymore. This is only alias. Yeah. So if somebody uh, steal uh, this uh, key, it's no problem. This is uh, useless. Okay. Um, but yeah, again, uh, recommended to generate the key using the hardware rather than the import keys. And then the step two, you just uh, define your crypto functions. Uh, in this example, I just define encrypt AES and then decrypt AES. And then um, step three, uh, you should familiar with the algorithm encryption mode. For example, in this code, I use a CBC mode. Yeah, you should uh, learn a little bit about the encryptions. And uh, you should um, familiar with like uh, how to encode or decode data and about the hex, hexadecimal or uh, bytes, yeah, about the format of data. Um, then uh, you should uh, able to do like a uh, join bytes, yeah. Because uh, if you uh, the uh, communication with HSMs, you will uh, communicate with the bytes. Okay, and the next thing is uh, HSM using a TCP/IP socket uh, programming to communicate. So you should use a package map on the Go uh, package, yeah, like this, net. With this, uh, you can uh, set up the uh, variable connections and then you can uh, connect to the HSM. Then after this, uh, you just compile the, the program and then you can connect to the HSMs, yeah. Until these steps, congrats, uh, because we have now a robust data encryption apps using Go. You can see on here, the result is same using the text sample, sample plan text, and then the cipher text value is same. And if I decrypt using the key, I got the decrypted value, example plan text. But now we have uh, the key in, in, in a secure environment, because now uh, there is no clear key anymore in memory all the keys uh, protect in HSMs. So that's it, my presentations, I think. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any question and answer. Yeah, so thank you, Mas Mudito. Yeah. Uh, okay. If you guys any, have any question, please drop on the, on the chat box here. We're still waiting for the questions. Maybe from our speakers. Do you have any question for Mas Mudito? Maybe here. Okay, but there's a way. Uh, how okay. to just type in this chat box? Right? Sorry. Okay. Uh, or can I ask directly to Mas Mudito? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you for your presentation, Mas Brito. Uh, it's wonderful, really. Uh, I just only know about the HSM uh, just now. But uh, uh, before this, uh, actually, I hear some articles about 
a quantum computing uh, that can, uh, you know, like uh, decrypt uh, an encryption very fast. Uh, yeah, we still haven't, uh, there's still yet doesn't exist the quantum computing, but sometimes in the future, maybe there's a quantum computers that can uh, decode encryption very fast and the encryption method that we have now maybe will be expired or uh, deprecated. So what do you think about this quantum computing? Uh, even if we save the key in the SSM or in some other uh, storage, uh, safe storage, uh, is it uh, still safe with the encryption? Or maybe uh, is there any uh, what is it research or inf uh, what is it improvement of the encryption method? Or maybe is there any more sophisticated uh, algorithm or sophisticated methods to encrypt the data? Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, we also got the information from our principal about the uh, the SAMs. And the roadmap is, uh, yeah, uh, they already aware about the quantum encryptions. So uh, there is will be improvement about the hardware and also the algorithm. So yeah, just let's see how the next, <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, yeah, there is an improvement for the hardware and the algorithm. No worries. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, is there any other question? If there is no more question you can uh, you can go uh, directly contact Mas Mudito through the email that he has uh, shared with you guys before and yeah okay so thank you so much Mas Mudito and we're going to move to Gabriel so back to you Marco thanks Winda so um, our third speaker and final speaker for tonight um, is a representative um, uh, he's basically we're going to represent Go Manila so uh, Gabriel Haldon um, will present New Age Databases and, uh, and Go, uh, a Go, descri uh, Go description of talk and uh, walk through new style of databases that have been built in Go and discuss some of the different use cases for each. Uh, Gab Gabriel uh, currently works at Turn.io as a senior software engineer um, and was previously at uh, Bits where he worked uh, building backend REST and GraphQL APIs in uh, Phoenix, and, uh, Phoenix slash Elixir. Um, Gabriel also spent time at Orchard Systems and uh, Sightline Maps as a senior software engineer and he finished a degree in psychology <laughs> um, from Ateneo de Davao University. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Okay, Gabriel, um, you're free to start yeah, um, your, doing your presentation. All right, thank you for the intro, Marco, and um, yeah, th uh, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, Sorry, you. Gabriel, I was really thinking uh, uh, we think your electric fan is blowing into your mic. Oh my god, not oh, there. All right. All right, better? Better. Okay, um, so yeah, uh, yeah. first of all, thank you to the host. Uh, for ha thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to Go Jakarta and Go Manila and to Brancas. So yeah, it's a great opportunity to be here and to be able to connect with other devs who are also excited about Go. So yeah, Marco has already introduced me, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, maybe I'll give a little, uh, I'll explain more a little about me. Um, so yeah, I'm a senior software engineer at Turn.io and I'm based in the Philippines. Um, I use uh, Elixir mainly and um, for work and I work as a backend de developer and um, uh, and as a backend developer, like most backend devs, we spend our time mostly working with databases. So I'm really interested and yeah, I'm really interested in distributed systems and databases. So hence this talk. So yeah, my talk is about new age databases in Go. And um, so maybe I should like, um, how do I share screen uh, here? All right, let's do that. Okay. So yeah, new age databases in Go and um, so yeah, what this talk is about, um, it's, it's a high level talk. Um, it's, it's mostly like, um, so it's basically, uh, I'm here to present a few modern OS, uh, open source databases in Go. And uh, these 
I think these databases are compel uh, compelling alternatives to traditional like SQL databases as you know primary databases for your backend systems. So yeah, it's a high level overview on a few of these databases. So uh, a, a bit about high availability and distributed systems. So these are like really interconnected uh, concepts because we, uh, we get, we are able to provide highly available services and applications because we, because we designed this, uh, we designed them as distributed systems. We built them as distributed systems. Um, so we want to build a reliable whole out of unreliable parts. And um, so, yeah, so this is why, like, I guess most, if not all software are essentially distributed systems. So in case you're wondering, uh, well, we're all devs, so I, I guess not much, what, not, not many wonder here, but in case you're wondering why, like Go, uh, Google and other like, like Facebook are, you know, barely down. They're usually just, you know, every time you check them, they're usually just up. Like it's rare that you would find them down. It's because they are essentially made highly available because they are like in the, behind the scenes, they are distributed systems. So, so what are these new age databases? So in this talk by new age databases, I, I mean, these are, these are databases that, that are distributed databases. Uh, they are strongly consistent. Uh, they support ad hoc queries and they have a simple or familiar, uh, familiar query language. And I listed down all these properties because I feel that, because what I want, the ideal is to replace, uh, replace the, uh, the traditional, like for example, SQL database as the primary database, right? Or at least to consider these alternatives to the to traditional SQL database. And see, since most developers are used to um, like strongly consistent databases. Uh, if we have like an eventually consistent database, you know, it's not usually, it doesn't suit all use cases. So it's not, not a good primary DB for your application. So that's, that's one property that's important, strongly consistent. We want ad hoc queries because if it's your primary DB, most likely as you add features, you want to add new queries, you want to support new queries on your data. And um, if your database doesn't support that, then, you know, this would usually, like for example, in Cassandra, if you want to support other queries, you, usually that would mean changing the schema of the, the table that you want to do new queries on. Uh, so when I say ad hoc queries, like SQL supports ad hoc queries. So yeah, we'd like that too in our new age databases. So this is something that's shared with, so when I say strongly consistent and ad hoc queries, these are properties that are shared with traditional SQL databases. And we'd like these in our like modern or new age databases. So yeah, so simple and familiar query lang language. So SQL or, or like in this, the examples I point out here are, you know, using either SQL or GraphQL. And and distributed because, and this one is what's, what makes them different, what makes these new age databases different from like traditional SQL DBs because um, yeah, essentially they're distributed and they're distributed because we want them to be fault tolerant. We want them to be highly available. So we'll touch more on that in the next slides. So um, shared features, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, so in the, in the databases that I'll be talking about, these are actually CockroachDB and um, DGraph. And uh, we'll, we'll only be touching on two because there's quite a lot of features on these databases. And there are others that are also interesting that we, we'll just mention, but we won't really be uh, doing an overview, overview on them. So of these two databases that I present, these are their shared features, as you'll see on this slide. Uh, so it says here like multi-active availability, horizontal scalability, LSM tree based storage engine, cloud native, horizontal scalability, and okay, that's a, 
Okay, that's a duplicate and strong consistency. But we'll touch more on those as we go along. So when I say multi-active availability, it means all nodes can handle reads and writes, unlike with a typical like SQL cluster with leader, follower, replication. So because normally, like let's say you have Postgres, right? Um, a typical Postgres cluster follows this leader follow, follower rep replication. And that means that when you have a leader follower like replication set up, you have one leader and you have multiple followers or multiple replicas, right? And all writes will only go to this leader node. And um, reads are distributed to all these like replicas or followers. So that's basically how, like, how it would look like as a, in a Postgres cluster or in a typical like, traditional SQL cluster because they weren't really uh, designed to be, initially designed to be like a distributed system or a distributed DB. So, like, so when I say multi-active availability, all nodes in the cluster, let's say you have three nodes in your cluster, all nodes in your cluster can accept reads or writes. Right, so so the load is more evenly distributed across all your well, the load is more evenly distributed across all your nodes. So yeah, and um, I mentioned here because of consensus replication, data is still consistent even when lo losing a, minor a minority of um, nodes in the cluster. Um, yeah, so we'll touch more on consist consensus replication later on. Oh, okay, I'll just uh, explain actually. Like when you say uh, consensus replication here is when, like when you write data to one node, we want, because the problem usually is we want data to be consistent across all of your replicas, right? So let's say if you have a cluster of three nodes, three nodes and so you write to this one node and you want this data to be replicated across the two nodes in the cluster. So use consensus replication is a way of ensuring that, that data is consistent across all, this, all these nodes. So there's use of a consensus algorithm so that all these nodes will agree on a, on a value for a particular right. And once, once there's like quorum or a majority of the nodes agree, that this is the value for this right, then, then that right will be committed. Yeah, so that's basically how it works. So that ensures that, that yeah, all data, all, all your replicas will have the same, or will, will have consistent data. Unlike with other like NoSQL databases, like for example, Cassandra, um, where replication is asynchronous and data is eventually consistent across the nodes. So, in that case, in Cassandra's case, where it's eventually consistent, that means a write hits one node. And then since replication is, is asynchronous, mean, meaning it doesn't wait for the other writes on these other nodes before the, the write is acknowledged, before the write is committed or acknowledged, then that means that if you try sending uh, another request right, right away to a different node, to this, let's say, second node, this read will not necessarily get like, the same or consistent data as there is in this first node here where you wrote the data. So yeah. So that leads to like, um, complexities, right? So it, you have to account for that in your application if, if you have an eventually consistent database. But in some use cases, that's fine. So they're actually, they have like great applications, uh, eventually, these eventually consistent databases. So yeah, um, another feature which is shared among all these like new age DBs are, is horizontal scalability. So uh, this is a fairly like common term that's probably mentioned a lot, but yeah, it's, it basically means easy to scale. So. Okay, there's the mention of cockroach here, but um, so when we say horizontal scalability, this means that if we have a cluster of nodes, let's say three nodes, when we add a new node to this cluster, we don't want to worry about like how to 
re redistribute the data in all these ex existing nodes to the new node, right? So in the case of Cockroach and this other, and this dgraph database, it will handle all these rebalancing of uh, data across all of the nodes in the cluster. That way, load is more like evenly distributed. So yeah, another feature that I wanted to highlight here, these are all features that I think are, are important, like this from my view as, as an applications developer. So yeah, uh, another thing I, I point out here is LSM tree based storage and engine. Um, this is a detail in, in the implementation, but um, I think it's important because the storage engine that the database uses um, has implications on how, on what kind of workloads it's good for. So when you see, like for example, Postgres and MySQL, although MySQL can use other storage engines now, but the default of MySQL, it, they use uh, a B3 based storage engine. And a B3 based storage engine is basically, it's just not great for writes. Um, they're great for, for workloads where you have probably like low, low write to read ratio, right? So that means, let's say 10, 10, 10 is to nine. Wait, one is to nine. So let's say one write is to nine reads. So those are like workloads where like traditional SQL databases are great at. But if you use but if you use them for like higher write workloads, like where, where like for example, 50-50, then you, you start experiencing issues. You're going to have to do a lot more database tuning. You're going to have to, um, and writes are going to be, are going to take a lot more time. So, and your operations are going to take a lot more um, resources. So, yeah. So in the case of LSM3 based storage engines, like for example, the, D, the DDC or DGraph and, um, and Cockroach, they use LSM3 based storage engines. So they're great for writes. And the good thing is that since uh, like it's easier to tune for reads than it is to tune B3 based engines for, for writes. So meaning LSM3 based storage engine, LSM3 based storage engines are great for handling writes and they could also be made um, great for handling reads. But with, three, uh, with B3s, a B3 based engines, that's not the case. Okay, so yeah, these are like cloud native. So if that matters to you, so if you use like um, Kubernetes to deploy your applications, um, then it would make sense that you would also be able to deploy your database using Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, so, so these, they, it, these databases support them natively. Okay, so now we, we have like the first database, which is CockroachDB. And um, some features that I'm highlighting here, uh, survive anything. This is actually their um, tagline. Um, and we'll touch on that a little more later. So it's uh, PostgreSQL compatible. So the good thing about this is if, if that is, if you're already using Postgres, then this is actually like a good thing, a good alternative if you're considering migrating to some other DB. Um, another great feature, online schema changes and it's admin, U, admin UI. So when I say, when Cockroach DB says like survive anything, why they have this in their tagline. And if, if you haven't realized yet, it's called cockroach mainly because of this, right? It's because it's fault tolerant. Um, their claims are that cockroach will survive hardware or system failures and, you know, basically be always, always available. But yeah, or as available as possible. So yeah, it has, and it's able to like survive anything because of these like uh, properties. It has, self-healing infrastructure. It does uh, live rolling upgrades, distributed backup or restore, and point-in-time recovery. And these are all 
features native to Cockroach, like not extensions. And um, these are like their, one of the, their core features, that, which makes Cockroach a really uh, great option for, you know, of course, we, we all don't want our database to go down ever. So I think this is a great um, value proposition coming from Cockroach. So PostgreSQL compatibility. So this, this means that it works. Uh, Cockroach can be used with uh, existing PostgreSQL drivers. So if you already have libraries that use Postgres drivers in your language, then yes, those would largely work with um, Cockroach. I think they will always work or largely work, but yeah, I guess they will largely work. Um, so Cockroach supports some extensions at the moment, but not all. Um, they're working on adding support for all of Postgres extensions, or at least major the main ones, the more popular ones. And um, oh, I, I failed to finish this line here, but yeah, it does not support other Postgres features so that which have to do with um, uh, like materialized views, I think, not, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, there are some features, but not really like, but the main Postgres features are, are supported. So if you don't use the, like these specialized features, then it shouldn't be an issue, which is usually the case, right? So yeah. And online schema changes. What's, what's great about, when you say online schema changes, yeah, so we, do a, we can do schema migrations without blocking reads or writes to the database. And um, this, this is a usual problem if you're, uh, as a backend developer, like it's common to encounter issues with um, schema migrations, causing locks to your database and you know, blocking writes or even reads to a row or multiple rows or the whole table. In, in when you're using Postgres or MySQL. So that's why typically we have to be very careful with, when doing migrations, when running migrations. Ideally, we, we run it during downtimes, off-peak hours. Um, and, you know, we try to, as much as possible, run, like, the versions of, of these, like, uh, like, what do we call it? DML statements, like uh, when you update a table, you, uh, when, you, when you add a constraint, let's say, we want to, like for example, in Postgres, you want to add a constraint to, to one of your columns. Let's say that constraint is, uh, uh, let's just say you add a foreign key, right? You add a foreign key to one of your, your tables, now, by default, this would be a, a locking, this would cause locks to your database, uh, to that particular table while it's running that migration, while it's doing that operation. But you could change it so that it does not do the validation step because when you add a constraint, usually, it, and foreign key is basically adding both a column and a constraint at the same time. So, and the constraint is that it ensures that whatever foreign key, whatever value you add for, let's say the foreign key is um, car ID. That, let's say, and the value you add is one. That one must be a valid ID of a car record in the cars table, right? So, so that's basically what it does. And um, if you run a migration, which, which adds a foreign key, then it does validation to ensure that any existing values in, in that column are already, uh, are pointing to a valid record, right? But yeah, but that's a, a locking operation. So we want to, we could skip that validation phase. We could set validate like false or something like that. And um, we would, uh, yeah, but anyway, the point is that there, there are a lot of things to think of, uh, like there are things to watch out for. There are a lot of gotchas when it comes to schema migrations for Postgres or even MySQL. So yeah, this, this basically solves that problem. So admin UI, uh, yeah. 
uh, Cockroach already comes with a with a nice admin UI that makes it easy to like monitor your database. Um, a lot of admin work can be done from from just that from the admin UI. Uh, there's lots of like different dashboards there that you can you can access, and um, it makes it easier to optimize queries like with this with a nicer interface to run like explain analyze. So if yeah, this doesn't come out of the box with, with Postgres, for example. And um, with Postgres, normally you'd have to use a third-party library, right? Third-party software for, for, this, for these features. But yeah, and uh, like, for example, PG Hero. But it's nice that out of the box, Cockroach already has this, and um, UI is really nice, and it's actually it makes it a pleasure to do, do, you know, to do database operations with it. So yeah. Okay. So on to the next database. Uh, this is dgraph. Yeah. Uh, dgraph is has a GraphQL query language. It uses GraphQL as its query language and not SQL. And um, it is. Uh, it's not relational. It's not a relational database. It's actually a, a graph database. It uses a graph model, so which is great. Um, like if you're using GraphQL and your database is a relational database, then there's like a, you're gonna need a translation layer between them because you're expecting to do graph queries but on a relational database. But since this is a graph database, you're doing you're using a gra graph query language, so you know it just makes sense. So, and the awesome thing about dgraph that I, one of the things that I find really compelling about this is you can just define a GraphQL schema. Um, and then once you load that up in dgraph, dgraph will generate all of the CRUD mutations and queries for you. Yeah. So, yeah. So a little more about the GraphQL query language. So it, this implies that if we're using a GraphQL query language for a database, this means that we no longer need an ORM and can just use an HTTP client to interface with, it, with a DB. And um, I think that simplifies things a lot because uh, a lot, in a lot of cases, like I, I don't think there's any perfect ORM for interfacing with a database. There's always uh, there's always going to be issues with ORMs and databases, and ORMs are typically large libraries, right? So in, in the Ruby world, there's Active Record. It's a really huge library. In Elixir, there's Ecto. In Go, there's Gorm, but uh, Gorm. I don't know what, how, how you pronounce that, but basically there's Gorm, I think. And that was probably a smaller li library compared to the others, but you know, but anyway, at least you remove this layer of additional layer that you need to learn so you could work with your database in your, in your particular language. So, yeah. And um, so, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, you can define a GraphQL schema and it will generate CRUD mutations and queries for you. And what are the implications of this? This means faster speed of uh, faster development time. We get speed of development out of this because, like a lot of times, a, a lot of times we, especially probably when working on when working on new features, when delivering new features, and these features are just crud features. Normally, we just uh, I think a lot of times these are just like standard crud. Implementation. So um, it's not. So these are things like really repetitive work that can be, you know, automated. So I guess in the case of GraphQL, they've largely done that. Uh, of course, there's you can still customize them when needed. You can customize like the mutations that they have, or you can you can also like create like a a proxy between the database 
uh, your typical web server, which will like act as a proxy between your database and your clients. So yeah. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, like it's a, it uses a graph model and it's not a relational database. So, and this is important because this has um, implications like relational databases, you know, joins in relational databases are exp expensive, um, but it's equivalent in, in a graph database in a, is a graph traversal and a graph traversal is very cheap, right? So a good like example of this type of query is like, let's say you have um, a person's table, you have person's table and you have a, let's just simplify it, like a follower's table, right? And um, one person has many followers. Okay, no, let's not do it that way. Let's, uh, okay, let's just do that, yeah. One person has many followers. And um, let's say you want to get followers count, right? You just want to count. You can express this in SQL very easily, right? You can just do a joins between these two tables and then do a count on the, on the followers for a particular, let's say, person. And, but that's not particularly, that's a, an expensive operation compared to, so if you have like a large data set of followers, your table, your table for followers has so much data, let's say three terabytes of data, it's going to take a long time. And normally how you would do that instead in, in SQL, it becomes like an issue in terms of performance. You would instead create a column in person, which, which would be like followers count column, right? And that column in fo the followers count column, you would just update it every time you add a follower to this person and that's going to be faster but um there's also issues with that in, in the sense that you know there's a good chance that data won't be consistent between them both meaning it could be that uh followers count is 10 but you already have like 12 followers so yeah unlike with uh in a in a graph database that's a very cheap operation like if you want to get person and you want to get their, um, let's say you get their followers, um, that's just a very cheap, like graph traversal. So, like it's not like joins, and it's a. Uh, anyway, point is it is it's cheap compared to joins. So yeah, other, um. Okay, other great databases to check out um, since I think I'm mostly done in time is there's TidyB, which is uh, MySQL compatible. It's also built with Go, but it's a uh, storage engine it's built in Rust. And, uh, and there's also Vitesse, which is MySQL compatible too, but this one actually builds on top of MySQL itself. It, it provides... Yeah, this is the database that YouTube uses. It's a Google open, open source database. Um, yeah, so it builds on top of my, my SQL. So I think, yeah, that's it for my talk. Um, are there, I think we'll proceed to Q&A. Yep. Do we have any questions? On their slide, though, let me check. So, uh, what is consensus replication? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, consensus consensus replication is a way of ensuring that all replicas have consistent data. So, because like these are distributed databases, so meaning there's, they, they're usually deployed as a cluster of at least, for example, three nodes, minimum of three nodes. So normally, when we have a distributed database, we want to replicate data from one node to all these other 
nodes. That way, when you, we send a read, we, we send a request, which is a read, then we can just send that read request to any of these nodes in the database. So what consensus replication does is that, yeah, it ensures that all replicas have, have the same data, right? Have consistent data. And it uses a consensus algorithm to get all nodes to agree to the same value before a write is committed. So like in the case of um, cockroach, it uses like this RAF consensus algorithm. And yeah, so that's basically like high level overview of what it is. Got it. And then the second question is, uh, what is an LSM tree based storage engine and why is it great at handling writes? Okay, um, so uh, it's great at writes because a write is committed as soon as it has written the data to, a, to like an append only commit log and written that data to memory. So, and then later on, this, this, the data in memory is uh, fl flushed to disk and writ written sequentially, which is a faster operation than like random writes. So essentially it, it buffers writes in memory and then, so, and then flushes them to disk later on. And to ensure that we don't lose th these writes, we don't lose this data, these, these writes are like just added on, a, on an append only commit log. So this is persisted to this, this commit log. And you know, since it's an append only commit log, this is like a very cheap operation. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Um, from our other speakers, do you guys have questions for Gabriel? Okay, I think I think that's it. Right. Thank you, thank you, Gabriel, for your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you again, uh, Mas thank Hafiz, uh, Mas Podito. Um, Wida, you wanna you wanna send us off? Yes. So thank you so much. Uh, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So thank you so much, guys, for uh, our our joining up today. Thank you for the speakers, Gabriel, Mas Mudito, Mas Hafiz. Thank you so much, and all the attendees for today. So uh, we're planning to do the uh, another Go Jakarta event on next uh, January. So please stay tuned on our meetup page, and we'll announce as soon as possible. So thank you so much, guys. See you again next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.